Hello Vinyl Community, how are you? So I have like two really shitty two or three weeks behind me. That's why I have not made any videos in that time. The, this was simply impossible. Usually I design my life uh, to stay out of trouble. And uh, it's quite fascinating how trouble manages to find you anyway. And uh, there's always some element in my personal environment that uh, desperately tries to mess with my zen and um, yeah when it happens you have to deal with it but uh, that's kind of behind me so uh, let's get back to the old me and talk about records and uh, I've been listening quite a lot in the last five to six days uh, actually I usually keep posting Photos of myself with records on Instagram. I never did Instagram and I just started not that long ago. Um, and uh, so uh, I find it certainly more satisfying than being on Facebook. And I'm aware of the fact that Instagram has been purchased by Facebook. So it's basically Facebook too. It seems like there is no escape from Facebook. And... Uh, but probably there is something about Instagram that mildly, mildly reminds me uh, of the good old days of the first generation MySpace, uh, which uh, was actually quite interesting, particularly if you are operating kind of in the world of uh, musicians and artists, and I think MySpace worked pretty good uh, in that department and um, to some extent Instagram can really uh, emulate this kind of uh, connectiveness uh, between a uh, between the audience and an artist for example I don't think that uh, the other platforms can uh, I don't get that kind of vibe from Facebook but um, anyway I don't like social media anyway, so let's not pretend like I, I'm somehow wasting my emotions and all that. So, um, I've been listening to this record, uh, but um, I do truly believe that uh, probably everybody watching right now knows it. Um, I mean, there was a time when I was wondering if a record like that is uh, meant for a broad audience or is this just a record for um, a close circle of uh, bass players and uh, fusion enthusiasts but uh, that would be a very wrong assessment because uh, yeah obviously there is a ton of uh, shredding and chops on this record no doubt about that but um, as a composer and arranger, I always felt that Jaco Pastorius was very accessible. This is very beautiful music, so um, you don't uh, you don't need to get lost uh, in the intricacies of his bass playing, because overall, as compositions, uh, it's quite a nice experience of very melodic uh, pieces of music or very atmospheric uh, sort of acoustic layer so um, it's kind of a it's kind of a mixed bag of two different approaches there are those rather lofty uh, atmospheric instrumentals on the one hand and there are quite beautiful soul tracks uh, with a funky twang so um, beautiful record and uh, it's not it's not as cerebral as some people think it is. Uh, it's quite accessible and, uh, and a very charming record overall. Now Jaco Pastorius is playing on Heavy Weather by uh, Weather Report. Um, this is a wonderful record. Um, I don't listen that much to Weather Report, uh, despite the fact that I'm pretty sure I have five or six of their albums. Um, this is certainly the most popular one, I believe. Um, I mean, the lineup is the quite wonderful. 
so this is a wonderful record from 1977. Um, in parts very musing uh, and almost meandering as you would expect from Weather Report and then it, again it's very funky. So uh, you get the whole program. I find particularly this uh, rhythmic combination of uh, Badrena and Akuna really cool. The one is playing a drum kit, the other one percussions and uh, works wonderful together. Um, now the next album, because I was on this kind of a fusion binge, uh, the next record um, I bought rather recently based on a uh, listening on a radio show, listening to a radio show by Dr. Rhythm that he does uh, and uploads on Mixcloud and uh, there was a track by Herbie Hancock from this album, Mr. Hands and uh, I immediately thought that I have to get this record. Um, this is this is exciting. This is wonderful music. It's quite unbelievable how good some people just can become as musicians. I um, mean, this is this is very tight. And uh, just check out the last song on the A side called "Just Around the Corner." I mean, the bass playing by Freddie Washington is just unbelievable. And um, it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's like a car race turned into music. It's so cool. Um, so yeah, I love this record. This is uh, one that was quite overdue. And uh, yeah, the good thing about Herbie Hancock is you get really clean uh, records. Um, original pressings from the 70s uh, for not that much money, so uh, I haven't paid that much for it, and uh, sounds good, decent enough. Um, yeah, and I mean the lineup is quite insane, I mean, I mean along the people that I know, like Jaco Pastorius is playing here, uh, you have Tony Williams on drums, you have Sheila E playing percussions here, uh, Alphonse Mouzon on drums, Wawa Watson on guitar, and listen to Wawa Watson playing on this track I told you just around the corner. It's incredible. It's a killer album. This was a great entry into the 80s by Mr. Herbie Hancock. Yeah, now I have two orange albums here, orange colored, that uh, both kind of have to do more or less directly or indirectly with uh, Big Star 1000. Um, the first one is uh, this record here, Mild Life from uh, Melbourne, Australia. I'm totally hypnotized by this record. This is so cool. Um, this is kind of in, in the style of music that uh, I come across a lot lately. Um, like some other records I've shown in the last weeks, like um, Leclerc or Al Doom and the Farids. This is kind of in that vein. There is not really, I don't think there's really a name for that style of music yet. That's why I call it psychedelic f jazz funk, which uh, which would be PJF as an acronym. This is really a bad acronym, <laughs> but I call it psychedelic jazz funk because it kind of tells you what it is about. Um, now this is a... Uh, uh, it's not entirely instrumental. Actually, the keyboarder is quite a good vocalist, so there are some uh, vocal tracks on it too. Um, the, the music really takes its time, um, so most of the tracks are like 7-8 minutes long. Um, great jazzy vibe combined with the very modern keyboard sounds, and uh, it's all very funky and in parts slightly mysterious, so very interesting record. I mean, I just come I'm just I just keep coming back to it all the time um, now uh, I was mentioning Big Star 1000 because he already sh had shown this record like two years ago and um, I haven't paid that much attention to it back then so I forgot about it about it but um, also you can't you can't buy everything that people on VC are recommending to you I would have to rob banks and gas stations just to afford that. So, um, but uh, I would have probably saved some money if I had bought it back then. So I think 
right now, particularly if you're in Europe, it's a little bit hard to to get this record. Um, also, also my own geekism or nerdism got uh, the best of me because I mean this album is called Phase, and I had found out that uh, they also like half a year later they recorded a, a seven inch. And they called this 7-inch Phase 2. So I had to get the 7-inch. Now getting that 7-inch here in Central Europe was a bit of a... Yeah. Problem. <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, so um, in the end I got it. So what I can do now is I can now take the album and take the 7-inch and just uh, put it in and it's together. Oh yeah, and my nerdism is satisfied and I can sleep well again. So, um, it's a great, great addition to the album. And uh, I don't want to talk about how much I paid for the 7-inch because uh, it would make me look bad. And uh, actually I don't want to think about it. So, uh, but this is a wonderful band from Australia called... Uh, Mild life and uh, I love the sound. Um, this is something, this is a style I'm listening to a lot these days. As I said, um, there is a band like Leclerc that's kind of similar, at least in my opinion, or uh, Aldum and the Farid. And uh, I find this quite interesting. This is like a kind of a new, new uh, aspect of sort of jazz funk uh, that's going on with this kind of a psychedelic uh, twist to it. Whatever, maybe I'm just rambling. Now I said I have two orange records. Um, um, this one is hot out of the factory, so to speak. This came out just now on Ostinato Records. And uh, this is super interesting. So it's called, it's called Group RTD. And the album is called The Dancing Devils of Djibouti. Now, I already read the liner notes inside of this double album. Um, and uh, um, this is super interesting. So, so Djibouti is obviously one of the countries on the Horn of Africa. Um, but it's a rather small country, kind of lodged between um, Somalia and Eritrea and Ethiopia. And uh, so, um, as, a, as a society and as a political entity it's quite locked up and quite isolated and um, this is probably not a good thing because we're obviously talking about a dictatorship uh, with uh, kind of a one-party policy but um, on the other hand a lot of countries probably manage to kind of survive that way regarding the fact that they are from all sides surrounded by countries in complete mayhem and uh, or at least in a, in a state of uh, decline that was kind of happening in the 90s and in the zeros and uh, oftentimes uh, yeah with uh, our contribution yeah or my best friends the NATO let's talk about the NATO one day um, so um, this is uh, the music of Djibouti, particularly sort of popular music of Djibouti is completely unknown to the Western world and has not interacted with the Western world at all for years, if not decades. And uh, at least the way it's described by Ostinato in the liner notes, they have kind of they kind of went the 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 bureaucratic way and just uh, kind of encountered the ministry of culture or something like that and started to cutting through red tapes and uh, in the end um, they were able just to go there and to work with the with the state sanctioned radio station and had access to the archives and started kind of to um, getting together this uh, band of uh, contemporary popular musicians of Djibouti and they recorded this album. Now as far as style goes, um, I have I have shown um, a while ago the Durdur 
album from uh, Somalia and uh, this is a very similar style obviously this is kind of the the same neck of the woods and um, but what's great about it um, is that uh, this was recorded in 2018 or 19 so just a while ago so uh, because usually if you collect music like that as I do um, you have to be just content with what you get so oftentimes this music was recorded in the mid 70s or early 80s um, even the the quality of the original recording is not that good because the gear was not that good because it was recorded somewhere in Mogadishu or Addis Abeba and um, but uh, in the end you get a curated record where someone was able to obtain seven inches and maybe some tapes and people try to clean it up by modern digital recording methods just to get an optimal result. It's never really optimal. You don't buy a record like that for the sonic experience, obviously. But um, the great thing about this album is that it sounds hilarious. I mean, it's, it's, it's a beautifully recorded album. It has a certain jazz feeling to it as far as the recording uh, quality goes. Um, I think most of the takes have been taken as a group recording so they didn't record just individual um, tracks in the studio but um, you kind of hear a very subtle interplay between the instruments and it kind of feels a lot like uh, um, multiple instrumentalists playing in the same room mic'd up at the same time so uh, it's a very it's a very organic album um, but it has a uh, modern uh, recording standards at the same time which makes it very unique because at the same time the music and its style has been completely frozen in time so it's a it's a bit of a time machine thing because uh, they are playing the kind of sound they played when they were young somewhere in the 80s maybe and recorded back in the day uh, and uh, at the same time um, you get it in this fresh uh, modern recording quality so this is quite unusual and uh, this makes it quite unique and um, I really like it I, I, I've just listened to this twice because uh, I got it uh, yesterday in the mail uh, from Ostinato and um, great joy I really enjoy it um, by the way just for kicks if you are someone who uh, wants to check it out in a digital downloadable manner I can give you here this Bandcamp code but only the first one can make it so you can freeze it if you like freeze the picture and write it down or just type it directly it's on Bandcamp so um, wonderful music really wonderful music and the reason why I was saying that uh, both of the orange colored records have kind of something to do with the uh, Big Star 1000 is that he was showing the Durdur album a while ago and was saying that he really likes it and um, I think uh, you would like this one as well particularly because uh, um, it's, it's very much in the same vein as the Durdur band but um, this is really well recorded and uh, so uh, it's a interesting. It's an interesting uh, look uh, into uh, the musical world of a country, being Djibouti, that we basically know nothing about. So, uh, great one by Ostinato. Uh, this is really wonderful that they managed to unlock this door for us. Super album. It's a double album. Um, the the tracks are. The individual tracks are quite long, actually. Most of them are like five, six, seven, eight minutes long, um, depending on the track. So uh, let's go. Yeah, I bought this one. This is a reissue album called Chimera by Duncan McKay. Now I bought this because I was watching a video by Derek Higgins and um, he was quite praising it. And uh, so I was immediately interested because I had heard the name Duncan McKay, but mostly in connection with the Alan Parsons project. So he was a, for on on some tracks he was a keyboarder, and um, this is uh, his solo work. I think this was his first solo album from the very early 70s. So 
I just kind of bought it blindly. Um, it comes in a nice uh, gatefold sleeve. It's a really weird cover and uh, even Derek was really puzzled about what these strange psychedelic <laughs> drawings mean or paintings. Is this what Terence McKenna saw when he was taking DMT? I don't know. So, how is the music? Now, um, first, for my first impression is that uh, Duncan McKay, as, as a keyboarder, as a Hammond player, as an ARP player, uh, as a clave chord player, can easily keep up with Emerson, can easily keep up with Rick Wakeman, can easily keep up with Patrick Moratz. I mean, he is really up there in the top league. Um, as as a as an album, it's uh, yeah. You you really need to have a kind of a fetish for Hammond and clavichord playing because that's all over the place. Um, and uh, it's quite a, it's quite exciting. It's it's basically uh, well, it's. It's shredding, shredding from beginning to the end, um, but uh, there are nice moments there. It's, it has a little bit of vocals on it, and uh, it's all kind of very proggy. And um, I guess to some extent this is a bit overlooked. Um, it's a bit of an overlooked uh, little jam from early progressive rock uh, days. And uh, who knows, maybe it will become more popular now. Not because I was showing it, but because it was re-released and uh, and uh, because Derek Higgins was showing it. And uh, um, certainly an interesting record. Um, probably for musically, it's not something I would want to be listening to like once a week, but uh, I'm Certainly curious to figure out how Duncan McKay's other solo albums sound, uh, particularly the second one. But it made me think of another album that, uh, at least in my opinion, is kind of in a similar musical vein, and that's uh, the Valentine Suite by Colosseum. Um, now, um, so I gave this one a listen after quite a long time. I haven't heard this for for a while. Now, um, yeah, this is uh, again a, another great example of sort of a proto progressive rock uh, slash uh, kind of fusiony. But um, I, th I must say, I, I'm not such a big fan of the A side, which is still very much sort of lodged into the realm of, of blues rock, which is not particularly something I'm crazy about. But uh, it really starts to. Uh, bloom on the B-side where this uh, mentioned Valentine Suite is. So the B-side is quite wonderful. Uh, yeah, this is again in a rather dark uh, gatefold sleeve and uh, it's a bit of a similar style I think with the Duncan McKay album. It's what it was made in almost uh, uh, yeah, I mean this was uh, 1969, and I think the the other album is like 71, maybe 72. Uh, is there a year? Actually, it's saying originally released by Vertigo South Africa in 1974. So um, I was not very precise on that one. Yeah. So uh, this is uh, the Valentine Suite Colosseum. Overall, a good album, particularly the B side, I must say. Now, uh, I must show you this one. Um, I mean, this is just half of the stuff I've been listening the last five to six days. But I didn't want to show everything because the video would be far too long. It's already too long now. It's crazy. Um, so I took only 50% of it. Maybe I'll make tomorrow another video with the rest. Oh, I love this one. This is Yekte by Alpai. Um, this is uh, this came out on Faraway Sounds. I've already shown you some records by Faraway Sounds in the last weeks. They kind of this, I think this is a Spanish label that uh, kind of digs into the direction of uh, Turkish Anatolian psych rock. And um, yeah, 
Alpi is amazing. Yeah, so Yekta is a compilation. Um, one that uh, gives you pretty good uh, overview of what Alpi is doing. I love this album. This is such a wonderful music. I mean, the first track is just uh, Chan Kara Goslum is just a killer. I mean, just try to, if you don't believe me, just try to find it somewhere on maybe Spotify. Alpai Chan Kara Goslum. You will love this track. It's killer. So, a uh, wonderful album by Faraway Sounds. Um, totally dig that. This is right now, this is my favorite sort of a Anatolian rock album uh, that I'm listening to these days and um, love it. Yeah, let's stay in the 70s. I was listening to the good old Jan Ackermann. Jan Ackermann is uh, certainly one of my favorite uh, guitar players. Uh, always loved his music. I kind of prefer his solo records to uh, the music he did with Focus. I like Focus, don't get me wrong, but uh, um, I can more relate probably to his solo work. Um, yeah, this is wonderful. This is a wonderful record uh, that uh, an instrumental album. Um, he, it's obviously a kind of a guitarist album and guitarist showcase, uh, showing a whole range and variety of, of of guitars that he's playing here. But um, I don't think he's. I mean, it's a it's an album where he's shredding a lot, a lot of uh, chops going on here, but. Um, he doesn't look like he's trying too hard to impress anybody. It just kind of happens. And uh, a lot of these tracks have actually a rather, yeah, very mellow, kind of a chill vibe to them. Um, I mean, particularly Streetwalker is just brilliant. I mean, Streetwalker is the kind of a soundtrack you should uh, have in your headphones when you are... I was just writing this on Instagram. Just when you are bicycling across Amsterdam, this is what you should be listening Streetwalker by Jan Ackermann. So yeah, wonderful album. Um, came out 1977. This is a German uh, edition. I mean, he did most of his albums on Atlantic. Um, yeah, you have Pierre van der Linden on drums on one track here, uh, who uh, is obviously his buddy from Focus. Super album. Love it. Um, and uh, because I was kind of in the Jan Ackermann mood, I did also Eli by Jan Ackermann and Kaz Lux and um, yeah another killer album wonderful record um, yeah again like Jan Ackermann solo album it has this kind of a jazz funk vibe to it uh, it's it's very soulful particularly the vocals by Kaz Lux are very uh, expressive and very playful very whimsical in parts um, so this is a very interesting record and uh, I have not seen it shown anywhere actually so this is kind of a shame because uh, it's a very nice album. Uh, great listen. Yeah, so that's it for now. And uh, what I certainly forgot to do at the beginning of my video is to make a little shout out to Rachel because I'm wearing a Tintin t-shirt. Uh, Red Sea Sharks, so uh, that should have been expressed at the beginning of the video. But now let's stop this uh, recording here and let's do something useful or important. Just what? I have no idea. Till next time. <laughs>